Once again, welcome to Mission Community Church. Thrilled that you are here with us today. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at Mission and thrilled that you are with us today. Each week I pray that you are warmly welcomed and that you leave here encouraged and challenged wherever you are in your faith. Because the reality is, is that we're all in different places when it comes to our faith journey, but I believe that God is a big God that is able to speak to us no matter where we are, and I, and I pray that each week as we gather collectively as a community of faith that, that he would speak to us, yes, collectively as a church, but then also specifically individually that we would cling to those words that, that he is saying to us. And so I hope that you leave here, again, challenged, but also encouraged wherever you are in your faith. We're picking up our, our series again this week on the parables of Jesus. And it's interesting because there's, there's a shift that happens in Jesus' ministry that he, he was performing all of these miracles, but then there's this, this shift in the way that he starts to communicate with the crowds and the masses that begin to gather. We've been spending the last couple of weeks in Matthew chapter 13, and there's an interesting verse in verse 34. It says this, and all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. So there is a moment in Jesus' ministry where he begins to communicate through these parables. It's his preferred method of communication. And and the last couple of weeks, we've been defining a parable as an earthly story that reveals or illustrates heavenly realities. The word parable itself, from the Greek, it actually means to cast alongside. And so what Jesus is doing, he's taking normal, everyday illustrations that the crowds during his day would have completely understood, and he's casting them alongside these heavenly principles, these heavenly realities, these kingdom truths. And so these parables are earthly stories that reveal or illustrate heavenly realities. And, and they're short. They're, they're short illustrations. They're short stories that we, I would suggest, love short stories. In fact, I was reading this week that that one of the reasons why we love short stories is because we are, our, our attention span is actually declining. Did you know that a goldfish has a better attention span than us as human beings? That the average attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. Humans, eight. Goldfish do better than us. And so when you think about that, this is why marketers, they're, they're so perplexed because they're trying to figure out ways to, to grab our attention in the first five seconds of, of seeing something, whether that's a, a social media post or that's a, a TV ad or a billboard or a newspaper, that, that they know they only have a, a few seconds to grab our attention. My, my family loves short stories. My kids, we're in this great phase where, where we're reading these short stories, Captain Underpants, yeah? And, and, the, and the big fights against Professor P.P. P. Diarrhea Stein Poopy Pants. Like there's actually some really good like themes and principles that come out of these, these books. Another one is Dogman. Are you familiar with Dogman? He's the crime-biting canine who's half dog, half man, but full human. And there are these they're short stories, these little snippets, these little comics that grab our attention and, and help communicate some truths. I think it's interesting that, that Jesus is using short stories, these parables, to help grab our attention, but then to communicate these heavenly realities. You know, we live in a, a culture today that that is insta everything. It's a microwave dinner. It's, a, it's an on-demand TV that even millennial generation and below, when it comes to social media, they're not even really interested in the feeds anymore. Like they're not interested in Instagram feeds or Facebook feeds. It's more about the Instagram stories and the Facebook stories. Because there's something about stories that help us to connect, that help us to Relate, and I think Jesus is arguably the greatest storyteller to have ever lived. And so here we are in this series entitled Parables, these short stories, these earthly stories that reveal heavenly realities. And, and as I think about what we're going to look at today, I, I want to look at four short stories. 
four short parables and unpack them a little bit. Sermon title this morning is, is this, Short Stories, Lasting Lessons. Short Stories, Lasting Lessons. Now, it's interesting as we dig into these next four parables, if, if you were with us for the, the first two weeks of our study, we looked at the, the parable of the sower and how the sower is, is sowing seed over different types of soil and, and there's all these symbols and, and illustrations and, and Jesus actually takes time in Matthew chapter 13 to unpack what that specific parable is all about. And then week two of our study, we looked at the, the parable of the, of the wheat and the weeds, the wheat and the tares. And this is another parable that the disciples go to Jesus and say, hey, help us, help us understand the parable about the wheat and the weeds. And, and so Jesus begins to unpack, okay, so, so the sower is Jesus, and he begins to, to correlate what these different symbols are. But then from here on forward, he leaves the interpretation up to us. He doesn't do any explaining. And I think this is a good thing. I think this is what helps make the, the word of God living and active, that, that we bring different perspectives to it and we, and we bring different situations and even different seasons of life that, that God speaks to us in those moments and we see it from a different angle that perhaps we didn't see it once before. And so here we are, Matthew chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Matthew 13. Pull it up on your mobile device. I, I read from the English Standard Version, so this is, uh, this is what I'll read moving forward. Matthew chapter 13. Listen to short story number one, starting in verse 31. He, Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Short story number one. Jesus is, is throwing out this earthly illustration. Here's a farmer who takes a little grain of mustard seed, plants it into the ground, and it turns into a, a great mustard tree. Now, it's interesting because Jesus makes a comment here in verse 32. It is the smallest of all seeds. There are critics of the Bible, critics of Jesus, who will take this specific passage and, and use it against Jesus to try to catch him in a lie. So, so the argument will go something like this. If you claim that Jesus is who he says he is, that that he is the creator of all that there is, then, then how can he go and make a claim such as this, that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds? Because if you are a botanist, then you know that there are actually smaller seeds than mustard seeds. There's the, the begonia seed. There's the orchid seed. They're much smaller than a mustard seed. And yes, a mustard seed is small, but but if Jesus is the creator, if Jesus is God, then, then he would probably know that the mustard seed isn't the smallest of all seeds. So, so he must be lying or he must not be God because he doesn't know that the begonia seed and the orchid seed are smaller than the mustard seed. Now, we can get caught up in, in those things, and I, and I don't think this is what Jesus is trying to communicate. Now, on one hand, in that culture, in that agricultural society, that the smallest seed that they had, there was probably a mustard seed. You didn't see too many begonias or orchids growing in Middle East. But I think more importantly is, is Jesus is using an idiom to communicate a truth. He's using symbolism. There was a phrase back in that day that comes from Jewish rabbinic tradition that would go something to the effect of as small as a mustard seed. And we use idioms like this all the time. In our day and age, in our culture. So have you ever had someone, you know, say something that they probably shouldn't have said and they said, oh, I just put my foot in my mouth. I mean, I don't even think you can put your foot in your mouth. Like they're not actually saying I put my foot in my mouth. It's an idiom. It's a saying. Or, or if you're in some sort of an argument or, or perhaps, perhaps your, your spouse is just kind of on you and you're like, get off my back. Well, you're not literally giving that person a piggyback, right? But you're saying, like, Le let up, leave me alone. Or, or one of my favorites growing up, my mom would always say, like, hey, hey, we're cooking with Crisco now. 
Like we're not literally cooking with Crisco, but, but we're in a groove. We're, we're moving and shaking. These are, these are idioms. He's fast as lightning. Well, he's not really fast as lightning, but he's fast. He's quick. So back in those days, when, when Jesus uses this, this illustration, this earthly story, it's the smallest of all seeds, the mustard seed. But when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. What he is saying is that, that back in those days, a, a mustard seed, if planted in the ground and under right conditions, it could grow to 10 to 12 feet in just one growing season. So the the contrast between something so small, yet growing into a 10 to 12 foot tree in which the birds of the air can come and make their nests, it's an amazing picture of the kingdom of God. That yes, it starts small. It starts in the, the heart of Israel, but it rapidly grows, exponentially increases over time to where when you look at the church today, that we're gathering here today as followers of Jesus to worship him and to hear from, from him. But then there are other communities of faith all over this county that are meeting in this very moment. That there are other communities of faith across this country, across this world who gather each week to celebrate him and to worship Jesus. That, that it is a big tree that started from a little seed. Short story number two. He continues the very next verse. He, Jesus, told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. So again, this would have been familiar in that day. Some of you may have some experience with baking, and so you might understand this illustration, this earthly story that there's a woman who puts a little bit of yeast and flour until it's leavened and, and that bread rises, turns into that loaf. It's interesting that, that yeast is, is actually a living organism, a single-celled organism, that if you were to have a pound of yeast, it would be over 15 trillion cells in that pound of yeast alone. And, and what does that yeast do? Well, when you put it in with the, with the water and the flour, it causes these chemical reactions to occur in which it's, it's feeding off of the simple sugars and, and it's emitting carbon dioxide and, and it begins to, to grow and there's energy that comes out of it. And so what Jesus is saying is that this, this little thing, this little thing of yeast that you, you put it into into a, a lump of flour, and it transforms the whole thing. Now, what is Jesus exactly saying? Because again, he, he helped to explain the first two parables, like how do we look at the mustard seed with becoming a mustard tree and that the birds are now inhabiting its branches, and, and what about the yeast that is now infecting the, the, the flower and it's causing it to rise. Like, what are we supposed to make of that? Now, there's different interpretations of, of what these two parables mean. Sometimes, to kind of bring us into like a little a cemetery, I mean seminary class for a second, that there is a term that scholars and theologians will use to help interpret the Bible, referred to as expository consistency or constancy expositional constancy. And so they'll, they'll look at these two parables and they'll say, okay, where have these symbols been used before and what were their meanings? And so if you remember to the beginning part of Matthew chapter 13, Jesus actually defines who the sower is, who the seed is, what the birds of the air. So in that first parable, the parable of the sower, that the seed is cast on the, the hardened pathways or walkways and that the birds of the air come and they snatch and devour the seed. Jesus says that the birds of the air are a picture of the devil, of the demonic forces who are taking that seed, who are taking the word of God and just snatching it from that soil, from that hardened heart. Now, what they will do then in this parable of the mustard seed is they'll 
use that same image, that same symbolism of the birds to say that, okay, now that the church has grown and have blossomed, that the birds of the air inhabit its branches, that there are demonic forces, the devil is pressing in on the church. Now, I do agree with that notion. I do agree that, that yes, that, that Satan, the evil one, can get into the church and infiltrate it and, and cause it to go awry. I do believe that, but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying here. He's talking about the kingdom of God, that as it grows and matures, that it's bringing shelter to the birds of the air. Some translations say the birds of heaven. To, to further unpack this, then we go to that next parable, that short story number two with the leaven, with the yeast. What is yeast often symbolic of in the scriptures? Sin. Sin. It's often referred to as a sin because it, of its ability to infect and, and be like kind of cancerous and, and spread. Now, now, if we use that that theory of expositional constancy to this parable, then listen to what it would say. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, or the kingdom of heaven is like sin. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. And so we have to be careful in how we interpret some of these parables. That he is saying the kingdom of, of heaven is like leaven, or like yeast that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Here's what I think Jesus is saying. When you look at the mustard seed and you look at the yeast that, that you can't see with the human eye, that small beginnings bring about big change. Small beginnings bring about big change. So let's think about it in terms of his kingdom, of the church. You know, I always found it interesting that when Jesus comes onto the, the scene over 2,000 years ago, he never really left Israel. Travel around Galilee, Capernaum, Jerusalem, but he never really leaves Israel. And then he goes to the cross, he dies for the sins of the world, he's buried, and three days later he raises from the dead, and then he spends the next 40 days ministering and teaching and spending time with his disciples before he then ascends into heaven. But before he ascends into the heaven, he gives them the challenge, the responsibility, these 12 ragtag dudes to, hey, go make disciples, baptize, build my church. And from this little seed, we have 2,000 years worth of history to see all that God has done in spreading his kingdom. His church is flourishing. His church is growing. That he said that my church, I will build it, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then I think about it in even the terms of, of our church, Mission Community Church. You know, it's over four years now that we started, that we, that we first met as a, a core group of about 30 to 40 people meeting in a storefront in Eagle View Shopping Center. Over those summer months, just praying and planning and, and figuring out, okay, God, how are we going to do this? What, what are we doing? We don't even know exactly what we're doing, yet we, we spent that time just believing that God was going to do something in it to where now today... We've had over 40 people who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus that we know of. That over 70 people have been baptized, 10 that happened last week. And, and that's just within our community here that we know of. Like, who knows how many decisions to follow Jesus have, have happened without the raising of a hand? How, how many people know, like, the different ways that Jesus has spoken, ministered, and, and spoken directly into some situation in which you've made a complete 180 and you followed back hard after him and he's continuing to move and guide and direct? That, that's just within our community. So let, let's, let's step it back just a little bit, that even as a church, we're... We're, we're passionate about helping other local ministries here in the area. And so one of those local ministries is the Bridge Academy and Community Center that we help support one of the staffers there at the BACC that, that's 
pouring into and giving themselves to inner city kids in Coatesville. How many kids have followed Jesus over the last decade as the, the Bridge Academy and Community Center has been ministering there in Coatesville? Or even Chester County Women's Services a ministry that we get fully behind and support as a church, that, that there are people that walk through the doors of CCWS that, that have unplanned pregnancies, and they don't know what they're going to do. They have questions, and yet they are presented with the gospel, and it's week after week I'm getting emails about how people are placing their faith and trust in Jesus. That, that's outside of this little community, but we still have a part of it. We're Transnistria. And now we have 16 children that are sponsored just in our church alone. 16 children in which there are loving, God-fearing families that are caring for orphans in Transnistria. And we, we don't even know the impact that that's going to have. That here is Andy. He made it back from his trip in Transnistria and, and giving up his time and his energy to pour into orphans there and bringing vacation Bible school there. Like, we have no idea of how those seeds are growing and maturing into these massive, big mustard plants, mustard trees that God has planned. I think back to an Old Testament story when the temple has been destroyed and, and God's people are, are back at work trying to rebuild the temple and they're, and they're running into opposition and, and it's not going as well as they would have planned. But then I love how God speaks over the people of Israel in Zechariah chapter four, verse 10. And he says this, he says, do not despise these small beginnings for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. So the mustard seed principle, the theme that comes out of the, the long lasting lesson that comes out of short story number one and short story number two is that small beginnings bring about big change. That God's kingdom starts out small, but it will exponentially increase as he continues to move his church forward. Short story number three, Matthew chapter 13, pick it up in verse 44. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Short story number four, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in today's term, that would be something like us finding something of infinite worth and just selling everything, selling off the house, selling off the dream car, emptying out the retirement accounts, selling stocks and bonds and, and getting all of the money that we have and, and going and buying that thing of infinite value, that, that sole thing that we are after and, and I would suggest that there are probably some of us even here today who are searching and searching for that, that thing. For some of you, it might be peace. For some of you, it might be hope or confidence. For some of you, it, it's, it's knowing that there's something bigger than me. It's knowing that I, I think there is a God. There's got to be a God, but I'm not sure what this whole God and faith thing is all about. I'm searching and searching and searching. And, and perhaps you found that. Perhaps you've, you've actually found God, you found Jesus, you found that there is life in him, that there is forgiveness of sins, but then, uh, I'll just dabble in it for a little time here, but I'm going to go back and continue to live the life I want to live. Okay, J Jesus, you can have this part of my life, but, but I'm going to keep this for myself. You know, this job is just way too important. This, this career, this, this money is just way too important. Jesus, you can have my time on, on Sunday morning volunteering in the kids' ministry, but, but don't take my time on Tuesday night. Don't take my time on Sunday afternoon when the Eagles are playing. No, no, no. Especially tonight at 820 when they kick off against Dallas and they beat them. You know, our culture today, I think... Have you heard of FOMO? 
Hashtag FOMO. Hashtag fear of missing out. Like this isn't just a younger generation thing. This is a generational thing that that we don't commit ourselves fully to anything because we think we're going to miss out on something else. And so, yeah, I'm going to give a a little bit of my time and energy here, but but I'm not going to go fully in because there's something over here that just got my attention. I I, want to grab after that. That we live in this FOMO culture, hashtag FOMO, F-O-M-O, fear of missing out. And what I think is happening in this generation, this fear of missing out, that, that our FOMO is actually creating WAMO. We are missing out. W-A-M-O, FOMO, is creating WAMO. Like, we are missing out. Like, when, when we're not totally selling out to Jesus, we are missing out on all that he has for us. That we are essentially saying, I don't believe that you've come to give life and give it more abundantly. That I don't think you can do far more exceedingly abundantly all that I could ask for or imagine. So, and so we're just, Jesus, you can have this area, but don't take this. This is mine. This is my closet, my territory. You can work over here. I'm going to stay over here. It's all good. Which I have to imagine is a huge slap in the face of Jesus who went all out for us. The son of God, the creator of all that there is. I like how the the writer of Hebrews puts it, and and this is one of my, my favorite passages, but at the same time, one of the most challenging for me, because the writer of Hebrews says this in chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a crowd of, uh, crowd of cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Some translations say the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What joy is that, that that you would set that before you, knowing that you're heading into an excruciating crucifixion? Like, what is that joy that you set before you that you endured the cross? The joy for him was giving glory to God for the the redemption of humanity. That it really is for his glory and our good. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That he went all out for us. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus literally emptied himself for us, emptied himself of his divinity and went to the cross and the full wrath of God was placed on him for my sin and for your sin. He went all out for us, so why aren't we going all in for him? Why aren't we selling out for Jesus? given all that we have, selling off everything and just going fully after him, that that hidden treasure in the field, that pearl of great worth. The writer of Hebrews, he says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that that we have 2,000 plus years of church history of of men and women of faith, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but 2,000 plus years of, of men and women, this cloud of witnesses that we can use to help encourage us and to challenge us to, to sell out completely for Jesus. So let us lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily entangles us. Now, I think of it this way, that if, you, if you've ever run a race before, like a, a distance race, uh, a marathon, or I know there was a season that I was doing a lot of triathlons, like I would do some crazy things to like 
shed that weight, to lay aside all the weight. Like if you're running marathons, typically you're wearing like these really, really short shorts. You know what I mean? And like these really thin and light shirts, you, you want to cut down that weight. When I was doing triathlons, I would even go as far as to shave my legs. Because I believe like if I could get rid of the hair, it would like help me be more aerodynamic through the air and, and through the water as I'm swimming, that you put on these swim caps to, to help cut through the water. Like we do all that we can to try to shed the weight, to lay aside every weight, to lay aside every sin. What does that mean then for us today? As we follow after Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, to lay aside every weight, to lay aside the career, to lay aside the house with the white picket fence, to lay aside the cares of what other people think about us or say about us, to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles us. What does that mean for you today? That the mustard seed, it, it starts small, it's a small beginning, but it, it results in a big change, a, a big kingdom, this exponential growth that the little yeast that in, infects the, the flower, that it causes this inward transformation of what Jesus has done for us. And that when we find that pearl, when we find that hidden treasure, do we sell all that we have to chase after it? You know, we're going through a season uh, of our, our church staff and ministries getting ready for, for 2020, and we're, we're coming up up with our ministry plans and our budgets for the next year. And, and on this ministry plan document packet that I have, there's a phrase that I have in there and that I, I try to, to reiterate as I meet with our staff over the next few weeks is, is one of the things I want us to do as a church is to dream big, but to step small. To dream big dreams. But let's be obedient for the small steps that Jesus is calling us to make today. Because we, we don't need to worry about tomorrow. There's enough stuff to worry about today. And as long as we are obeying him today, taking the small steps today, he's eventually going to lead us to where we're going to be tomorrow, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. Dream big, but step small. And as we do that, God is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine, but it's in the small steps of obedience today that lead to the big dreams of blessing tomorrow. Don't despise your small beginnings. You know, that small thing that God is doing in your life right now, that, that seed that he's planted, don't despise that. You don't know what that's going to grow into. You don't know how God is going to bless it. So take the small step of obedience today, which will result in the big dreams tomorrow. Don't downplay these small beginnings to stand together as we pray. Father, again, we remind ourselves that it is all about your glory. That you are the one who is seated on high, seated at the right hand of the Father. That one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that you are Lord. And so our purpose is to glorify you and to enjoy you forever. And so the small beginnings that you are developing, the small beginnings that are happening in our lives, if, if that's some act of faith that we're uncertain where is it going to lead in the future or, or even here through Mission Community Church or some of the other churches that are starting here in this area, help us not to despise those small beginnings. But to look at the greater picture of all that you are doing. 
that you are building your church, that you are rescuing us one soul at a time as we place our faith and trust in you for salvation. So we thank you and praise you for forgiving us our sins and bridging that gap that was once between you and I, between you and us. We are clothed in your righteousness. The same spirit that rose your son Jesus from the dead is alive in us. Help us to grasp that right there. In Jesus' name.